My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. I'm Savannah Joss, and today's leadership quote comes from Winston Churchill. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. Thank you so much for listening all around the world. Here's your host, my dad. Hey friends, welcome to episode 86. Just a reminder to check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash 86. Also, if you haven't joined us for our weekly Zoom chats on Wednesday afternoons at 2 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Central, check out leaderassistant.com slash community and join us in our Facebook group, our Slack community, and our Zoom chat registration. Again, weekly Zoom chats, uh, global Slack community, and Facebook group. Uh, Join thousands of assistants um, in our free community, leaderassistant.com slash community. Hope to see you in there and enjoy the episode. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Leader Assistant Podcast. It's your host, Jeremy Burrows. And today I am talking with Savan Joss, the founder of Joss Search. Uh, Savan, how are we doing? Good, thanks. How are you, Jeremy? I'm doing good, doing good. And you are, where are you today? We're in London. So it's it's, uh, two o'clock in the afternoon for me. So it's early morning for you, is it? Yeah, it's about almost 8 a.m. So, yeah. That's not too bad. (laughs) Um, It's funny. I actually had a dream uh, last night about my family getting ready for a London trip and we're all excited. We're about to go to the airport and we decided, Oh, you know what? Maybe we should check the leather, the weather in London. And we looked at the weather and it was like 30 degrees and snowy. And we're like, Oh no, we didn't pack anything warm. So we're scrambling to get warm clothes and coats. And I don't know, it's kind of a random dream, but but it was kind of odd. Is that because you knew you were talking to me today? Apparently, apparently. Uh. Well, no, I, I, um, it's pretty much always raining. So as long as you bring a rain Mac, you'll be all right. Nice, nice. All right. Well, enough about dreams. Uh, what was your very first job and what skills did you learn in it that you still use today? Uh, my first job was um, deliver, sort of serving pizzas in the uh, pizza shop in our local village. Um, but I didn't do that for a huge amount of time. But the most relevant one was waitressing. You know, I, I went to a rest, our local sort of restaurant and um, it was absolutely brilliant. It taught me, taught me everything, you know, customer service, really, just all about customer service and working quickly and finding solutions um, and also hard work because it's really hard, mm. <laughs> really hard work. Um, and I loved it. Yeah, I loved it. It was nice. great. So then where did your career trajectory go from there? It's, it's like, like like most people's sort of recruitment story. Um, I, you know, I'd never sort of, it wasn't my dream to, to be a recruitment consultant. Um, but I just found I was really enjoyed working with people. Um, and I liked the energy that that provided. And I um, got into sales quite early on. I did various hilarious jobs like selling windows door to door. I don't know if double glazing is a big thing in America, but... I did double glazing sales over here and then um, moved into selling software um, and then ended up falling into recruitment and um, haven't left. And that was 17, 18 years ago now, I think. Yeah. So what's your favorite breakfast cereal and why is it your favorite? What's my favorite breakfast cereal? Um, Porridge. Do you know, do you have, do you know, like oatmeal? Yeah. Yeah. We don't call it porridge, but yeah. No. Yeah. I absolutely, yeah. Cut steel. Is that what you guys call it or something? Sometimes. Um, Yeah. Yeah. um, But that's my steel cut. That's it. That's my absolute favorite. My girls love it. Um, I love it. It's just really filling. And my grandpa's Scottish and um, he 
used to always raise me on it. And um, a little tip is to add a pinch of salt, makes it really delicious. But yeah, I love it. My favorite. So if you had a day where you could go and do anything in the world uh, with unlimited resources, what would you do and where would you go? Um, it was I, I, I sort of really struggled with this one. Um, I, I, I think... <laughs> Um, I think I would really, really like to go to, um, Patagonia, um, in, in, in the South of sort of Argentina and Chile, um, and just sort of see how they live. I, I watched a documentary once on, um, the, the, the sort of the horse, the horses and how, how they depend on them, um, in that area. And, um, the, the wildlife there is just absolutely incredible. You know, it's such a, um, a flurry and like a range and, you know, the terrain is really different. And, um, I think I would, you know, I'd really like to, to spend a day down there, you know, just really exploring and, um, and, and, and seeing what it's like to live in that region, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Or random, I know, but, um, it's just somewhere I've always wanted to go. Yeah. It's great. What about you? Uh, you know, I, I have, uh, probably somewhere I honestly don't really care where but it'd be somewhere up high in the mountains um, where we could hike all day every day up really high and see some amazing views but then it also would end at the end of the day we would have like a really nice hotel room with a hot tub and you know <laughs> some luck a soft <laughs> a soft bed <laughs> yeah. yeah rather than a hard roll mat exactly yeah makes sense Cool. Okay, so you um, own a recruiting firm and run it, run a recruiting firm, and it's specifically, primarily for assistants. So, why did you start a recruiting firm? Well, um, I started a recruitment company because I'd been in the industry for a while, and um, I just felt really strongly that it could be done better, and I wanted to challenge, challenge the status quo, and see if I could do it better myself. Um, I've always been really inspired by companies that professionally and personally challenge their employees um, and also who, who treat them like adults. Um, and I was noticing that a lot of other companies were doing that, but the rec- recruitment sector sort of still seemed a bit archaic and wasn't wasn't really doing it. So I wanted to see if it was possible to, to, to achieve that. Um, and 10 years in, I do really feel that um, we have that balance here of sort of treating people like adults, but providing a really good service and having a good place to work where you're developed personally and professionally. Um, and in terms of sort of focusing on assistance, um, I've just always been really intrigued by the role and um, I still continue to be. I think it's such an under um, explored, I should say, role. It's it, as with a lot of the support roles. And I don't know if you've seen our website, but we call them the hidden heroes, you know, the people who work behind the scenes. Anyone in a business, I think, environment or, or, or in any walk of life, really, who are doing really great work and don't get the recognition for it. I think psychologically, I find that really interesting in terms of why people do that, you know, um, and I just sort of gravitated towards it um, and um, have continued to, you know, enjoy uh, representing and meeting executive assistants and personal assistants and seeing receptionists become executive assistants and seeing executive assistants become chief of staff. You know, I've continued to sort of really enjoy that journey. Um, And I like the fact that I've been able to work with the same people for for a long time, you know, who've come to me right at the start of their career. And they're now, you know, really, really senior um, exec assistants or chief of staff. And and, and it's just been really, really nice. Um, And I can't ever imagine doing anything else, to be honest. That's great. So how do you encourage someone who's kind of at the beginning of that process do you place them strategically in a role where they can really get a lot of exposure and experience but also have room to grow totally and you know we have to be really strategic because um, ultimately our clients you know when they come to us and they say I'm hiring they don't want to be hiring again in a year's time right Mm -hmm. and anyone ambitious is going to want to move and develop within 18 months and so striking a balance um is really is really interesting for us and challenging but strategically we always know when we're interviewing someone how ambitious they are because they, we delve into that part of them and we want to know where they see themselves why they're wanting to pursue this career and then place them in a role in an organization really more than the role it's all about the organization that we think will either nurture that and develop them or, and if they're not that ambitious and 
happy to sort of stay in the role they're, they're doing then place them in a different role basically but we're all about finding the right person the right job and the right company and and and, and that does mean sometimes not making a placement because we know it's not the right thing for that person you know um but de- it's yeah definitely um we have some companies that are much more forward thinking than others and the ones that are really forward thinking and tapping into their ea pool are doing amazing things with their ea talent you know so what's one of the biggest mistakes that an assistant makes when crafting their resume ha gosh focusing on duties you know, like I, I rarely see, I see this more often than not. If I'm hiring for salespeople or, um, you know, for people internally, the CVs I get are really achieve are always really achievement focused. Um, and I think that is what I see lacking time and time again on an executive assistant's CV is it's all about the duties and the duties are replicated across their, you know, 10, let's say 10 jobs, five jobs, three jobs, doesn't matter. Um, and actually each job will have been totally different. The, 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 the duties might actually have been the same, but the context around it, the, the achievements, the, um, the type of work that you'd be doing is, is likely to be different. And I think that could be celebrated a lot more by executive assistants on their CVs. You know, I meet EAs day in, day out who have saved their company hundreds of thousands of pounds on procurement, you know, challenges or they've put together global investor relations conferences they've you know um organized company offsites they've put together board papers research documents you know specific projects specific achievements that they've got involved in that they just failed to put on the cv and actually you know totally should be on there (laughs) so how do you what's your process with helping them with their resumes do you they kind of submit their resume and then you kind of sit down and walk through it line by line or how, how do you do that process? Well, we get hundreds of resumes every day, as you can imagine. Um, and so we, if, if we are speaking to someone who we think has the potential to be right for our industry, we will screen them on the phone. We'll speak to them. And if we think that they're right for us, we'll book them in to meet with us. And if they're not right for us, we normally always try and give them some advice on, where to go with their career and if there's some you know sometimes we see really glaring spelling and grammatical mistakes that will point out to people um but generally in the interview if if they come in to formally register with Josh search because they want us to represent them in their job search as part of the interview process if there are suggestions to be made we will give that to them at the end of the at the end of the interview as well as sharing feedback on their interviewing style and and if any anything they can work on for that we also give them um tips um on things they can do as well, you know, like to, to, to take away. We try not to change people's CVs because they're generally an expression of that individual. Um, but we do give them lots of advice on how to make it look better. So what's, you said you get a hundred or hundreds of, of resumes. Hundreds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, hundreds. What's one tip that you could share with assistants that could make their resume stand out? Short. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it short, make it punchy, um, don't have it on five pages, don't list the detail of absolutely every single job, you know, and focus on achievements. I really, I see CVs that are 10 pages long, I see CVs that are four pages long. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're interviewing, um, let's say, for example, you're interviewing um, an investment professional for a private equity company who's a partner, they'll have a one page CV, there's no reason why an EA can't have a one or two page CV, you know, as well. And I think we're, they are conditioned into just putting too much, too much information onto, onto it that, that isn't necessary. Yeah, that's great. So are there questions <laughs> that you like to ask in interviews with assistants? Yeah, I mean, for us, it's all about fit. And you, you probably agree, right, Jeremy? It's ultimately it comes down to the chemistry between you and your boss. If mm-hmm. you... If you have a good relationship with your boss um, and the chemistry is there, then you're, you know, the job is so much easier. And um, so we always delve into the type of managers that get the best out of those, uh, the, the PAs that we meet. So it's asking them what kind of management style gets the best out of you? What kind of management style do you not enjoy working for? Who's been your best manager and why? You know, what's your pet hate from a manager? More often than not, people say being micromanaged <laughs> mm-hmm. or 
poor communication. I think for executive assistants, their biggest struggle is working for someone who ignores their communication, um, which I find fascinating. And whenever I meet with execs, I'm always like, why do you have an executive assistant if their email isn't the first email you answer? Mm -hmm. Surely, surely responding to them is your biggest priority because if they don't know what to prioritize or how to prioritize because you're not communicating with them, how can you expect them to do a good job for you? Um, so it's always trying to understand more about who they work best with, you know, and what kind of person's going to get the best out of them and, um, you know, really focusing on that. We also try and ask a lot of um, sort of hypothetical situational questions. So, you know, um, if you were in this situation, what would you do? You know, let's say, for example, your partner's got this, this and this going on. How would you prioritize it? Um, just to try and understand their logic and how they how they are, how they prioritize and how proactive they are as well. Because those are the things that we look that our clients ask us for the most is they want someone with a great attitude who's proactive. Mm. You know, that's that's those are the two, you know, most ultimately from our perspective, important attributes that we look for from people is have they got a can do attitude? Are they going to just roll that roll the sleeves up and get stuck in and get the job done no matter what? Mm. And are they going to be able to think in we call it walking in their partner's shoes, you know, are they actually going to be able to imagine themselves walking in that person's shoes, caring about that day, or are they just going to view them as a calendar where it's like, oh, that looks really pretty. Let's put that next meeting next to that meeting. And actually they haven't allowed for enough travel time for the person to get from one meeting to the other, or even go to the toilet and have lunch, you know? Mm. Um, so I think those, those are the key things that we're always testing for and looking for. And, and ultimately, you don't need to have experience for that. You just need to have common sense and logic and, and be able to think practically and think ahead, you know? Yeah. So let's flip it over to the executive side. What's, what's maybe a tip that you would share with executives to help them get more out of their assistant? I always say to them, just respond to your EA first, like communicate with them. You know, don't expect them to be mind readers. I mean, really, you know, we all, you know, assistants will do their best no matter what. But if you communicate with them and you make sure you you regularly communicate your priorities, the business's priorities, and you respond to them in a timely manner and find the best way of communicating that works for you. I mean, for me, it's with my with the team that helped me on the operations and support is, is WhatsApp is like really, you know, straight away. They just WhatsApp me and they get a response. Um, so it's a case of finding a communication style that's going to work for for you as the exec and making sure that you give the PA or EA priority to your, your communication and time at the start of every day or, you know, a couple of times a week, you know, cause I think it's, I think otherwise it's impossible to do the job really, really well. I mean, you can do it well, but you could do it so much better if, if you had that communication. Yeah, I totally agree. That's, that's a great tip. Um, I've, I know a lot of executives that don't treat their assistant as the kind of the, one of their top VIP, if you will, no. um, for when it comes to emails and texts and it's just really hard to, hard to get things done and, and keep momentum moving forward if you don't do that. Yeah. You just, you, sometimes there is just a decision that you can't make and you need them to make that decision. And if they don't respond to you and make that decision, it's just left hanging around. It makes you less effective. And, you know, when I meet execs who are like, Oh, my PAs, I need a new PA. I need this. I need that, you know, and then you sit with them six months later, it's she's, she's not good enough. He's not good enough. You know, they're all, they're never, those particular types are never willing to reflect on themselves and what they could be doing differently. It's always the EA's fault. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And quite often it's not the EA's fault, you know, yeah. but often it's their fault for not communicating properly. And I have absolutely no problem telling them that. They don't like, like it, but I tell them <laughs> anyway, because <laughs> I'm not going to find them another EA and put them in another situation where they're going to get fired in six months because you can't communicate, right. you know, it's just a waste of my time. So how do we help executives like that and, and HR departments, uh, maybe even other recruiters and um, other execs and teams in an organization value assistance more? So what I hear time and time again is that EA, the EA pool can take up sometimes a large chunk of their manager's um, time. And actually, I think where EAs could really help themselves is um, making sure that they're being as professional as possible at all times. 
being completely discreet, um, you know, refraining from sort of, I don't know, but gossiping, you know, refraining from gossiping, refraining from getting involved in office politics and, and, and treating their role as a really professional role where they where they are mature and um and therefore the 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 company really recognize the value of that i definitely am seeing that more and more and more um but equally it's a case of quite often i hear um exec execs and executive assistants there's a real disconnect between what progression is available to them and the value of the role and um and that ultimately i think comes down to unfortunately the behaviors of some rather than the majority you know and um teamwork i think amongst executive assistants is the most important thing and when you have an ea team in an organization that are working really collaboratively to get you know almost working as one to get things done um then you start seeing that companies really recognize the value of it because they can start going to them with things that you know they didn't think the EA pool would be able to do and actually can do. Um, so I think it's a case of that on the one hand, it's have, making sure that the EA population within any company are working collaboratively and effectively together. Um, and on the other side, it's a case of um, making sure that companies are viewing them as a, like a talent pool in themselves within the organization. Because I think there's there's this disconnect between what can we do for them in the long term you know we want to try and keep them in their role rather than progressing them because we don't know how to progress them because there's no obvious career path you know if you hire an analyst the career path is obvious you know to becoming a partner whereas if you hire an ea you know what is the what is the next step and i think companies are, are afraid um of, of 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 what that might look like from a turnover perspective but equally from a um, from a uh, practical perspective, how, how do we actually put that into practice? Um, so I think it's a combination of those two, basically. I think that's a bit long-winded, but I, I hope that made sense. Yeah, no, that's great. So on that note, how can an assistant grow their existing skills and develop new skills so that they can kind of work along that career progression? Yeah, because, you know, I've, I, I've seen executive assistants progress into all different types of roles. I've also seen fantastic executive assistants stay within their role and progress and develop their skills. So you don't have to move away from being an EA to progress and develop. You know, you can stay as an EA, but just, as you say, developing yourself and developing your skills. And it's really interesting because I was meeting one of my office manager clients a couple of weeks ago and her first, her education was like a, a business man. This was in, in the eighties. It was a business management, um, not quite a degree, but um, a two year, a two year course, um, where it was all a, for executive assistants to understand how a business operates. And this was before she'd even started her EA career. I just thought that was amazing, and I think that is what is needed, you know, for, for EAs. They don't. They need to just be able to actually understand what the business does and what the pressures are. Therefore, they'll be able to understand the pressures on their execs. And they'll also be able to understand where they can add value in that business. If they put, if they can get some context on what the actual, let's say, front office part of their company do. So if it's whether it's, uh, if, for example, in our industry, it's private equity. So the front office, they're the deal doers. They're out there. They're looking for companies to invest in. And then they invest in them and then they manage them. That's the simplified version. If they actually went into that in more detail. Who are the investors? What do they want to see? Why are they important? What companies do they look for? And, and it's not just transactional. It's not just a case of putting a meeting in. You know, Then it becomes really interesting, the work that you're doing. And that's how you start adding value because you can have intellectual conversations with the person you're supporting and they start recognizing and valuing your opinion. Um, and then you can start exponentially developing your skills into the other business areas that the company operates in, you know, and that's, that's when I've seen the best EAs who have the best careers, they're the ones who bide their time, develop themselves every day, ask questions, try and learn new things, um, shadow other areas of the company, get exposure and upskill themselves within other business areas, and then make their move 
not day one, day two, you know, we're talking like a year, two years, three years in, a role becomes available and they know because they're well networked and they're using their network internally and they put themselves forward and they show a good business case as to why they why they could make it, right? Hmm. And I've seen EAs, like I said at the very start, become chief of staff, become head of legal affairs, head of investor relations, heads of HR, you know, they, they, they've moved away, but they've never, it's not been a case of they've gone in day one, done a good job and they're asking for a promotion or asking to move out of that role. They have, you have to earn it. It's a slightly harder way of going about it, but you have to earn it. And then on the flip side, you've got EAs who have progressed with people um, and, you know, stay in their EA role, but just take on loads of projects. Um, you know, they take on all, they take off all the pressure off their, off their executives so that that person can purely focus on if they're the CEO running the company or if they're an investment professional looking for deals, that person doesn't have to think about anything else. Everything else is completely taken care of. And, and those, sadly, I don't see that enough, you know, um, but it's definitely becoming that way. And I do think that it's becoming a more professionalized career choice for people, um, which is great to see. Yeah. And I, I love what you, um, kind of your tips on this whole world, because I, I always say, you know, I get assistants asking, like, how do I develop? How do I uh, grow? And one of the things I like to always encourage assistants to do is to read what their executive reads and listen to the podcast that their executive listens to, um, go to the events that they go to if possible. Like, it's not just about, yes, I agree that, I mean, you should do training for assistance specifically. And I do a lot of that and I provide a lot of that. And I think that's valuable, but I think that assistants need to think outside the box and get trained in other areas of their company and their business and take the courses that their executive is taking, um, just so that they can get a more well-rounded education and skill set. Absolutely. And that, and, and, and equally, you know, if, if you, if you can, if your exec, for example, in a small company has responsibility for ops or has responsibility for finance or has responsibility for HR, take that pressure off them, educate yourself in that area and, and take on that responsibility, you know, mm-hmm. um, for them. And I think it's, it's, it's about curiosity ultimately, and it's about intellectual sort of thirst, you know, thirst for knowledge. And if you have that thirst for knowledge and you are curious and you want to be the best possible executive assistant you can possibly be, whatever that looks like to you or to the exec you support. Ultimately, if you know what pressure they're under and if you know what they're, what challenges they're facing and you can actually understand it, you'll be able, you'll have better judgment when it comes to making a good decision. Mm. Um, and without that, you you will struggle. You can do your best, but you're, it's never going to be the same. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and, it, and, and, and 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 that's where it comes down to is, is developing your ability to have good judgment, because that's what your your exec is relying on you for is to have good judgment. Um, and if you can demonstrate that because you've t- taken the time to understand the pressure and understand what it actually means in context, you're probably going to be able to make a better decision. Hmm. That's great. So let's let's transition and talk about salary. So yes. I think in general, from my experience um, and talking to other uh, EA trainers and coaches, in general, assistants seem to be underpaid. Why do you think that is? Is that um, in the US or in in the UK or just globally? Have you found? Um, I, I mean, I've had I've had um, assistants reach out in the UK as well, but I mean, primarily the US is what it, where I've had the direct experience. Yeah, I can't. I mean, ultimately, I, I, um, I, I'd need to explore more in that in that market. But ultimately, I find that when an EA comes to me and they're underpaid, quite often it comes down to their confidence and their ability to negotiate a pay rise. Mm-hmm. Um, you know that that's an area of of, of um, and again, it goes back to them being hidden heroes. Not, mo- most fantastic EAs or support people are, are, are operating behind the scenes. They don't want to be at the, they don't want to be the stars of the show, right? Um, they want to help someone be the star, um, and they want to silently be the star. And that, in turn, sometimes means negotiating and and almost selling can be quite challenging. Um, and that's an area that I always see 
from some really great assistants that come in is they really struggle to sell themselves. They're so clearly absolutely brilliant, but incapable of selling themselves in an interview. Mm. And I always think to myself, if they're incapable of selling themselves in an interview to me, how are they going to be able to sell to HR or wherever that they need a pay rise, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I think if you're, if you're in a role where you're feeling underpaid and undervalued, first of all, you've got to do your research, you know, and have a look at the market and see what you're being paid in comparison to other PAs in the same industry in your, in, in, in your sector. Um, and then obviously bring that data and take that to HR and, and negotiate a pay rise. But in terms of if you're, what you're asking is just generally are EAs underpaid I think it depends because each, you you know, you've got companies where there's 50 EAs and amongst that 50, you have a totally different caliber of service being provided by those EAs. You have people who are purely transactional and just completing what's required. And then you have EAs who are really going above and beyond and doing all of the things that we've just discussed. And so from an HR department's perspective, I get that it's really difficult to have a flat structure when you have clearly got higher performers than others um but i think like in the uk the base is quite good um it's quite a good salary you know and and generally we don't find people sort of complaining about it too much um what we do see regularly is people being penalized unfortunately for loyalty which is ridiculous but Mm. the longer they're in a company quite often their pay rises are really incremental and, and and marginal and if the only way they can get a large pay rise sometimes is to leave. And that, I think, needs update, addressing. Because, again, if you've got a top performer and you don't want to lose them, you know, and they can go out into the market and get paid £10,000, £15,000 more, then you obviously you know, need to pay that, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I think that's probably where the disconnect comes. It's, it's down to EA. It's not necessarily being the best negotiators on their own behalf, sometimes absolutely fantastic when they're doing it with the company's money or their exec's money, Mm -hmm. when it comes to trying to get themselves a pay rise, really struggle. Um, And again, I think um, like not trying to ensure that you're not being penalized for loyalty by making sure you have that quest, that conversation at any point that you're feeling unhappy about your salary is if they don't know that you're unhappy, they can't do anything to change it. Yeah, and I think I think you, you hit it spot on. The uh, I think the number one reason that assistants are underpaid is they don't ask and they don't know how yeah. to ask, and they they just yeah, like you said, there is that hesitancy to ask for the raise that they really deserve and 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 need. And and that's where the focus should be. And then I think you'd find that EAs are feeling less undervalued, and they they they, they quite often are are undervalued in in the sense of you know most of the time they don't get a thank you (laughs) you know most of the time the only time you hear sometimes hear from your exec is when something's gone wrong um but when everything's going really well you don't hear anything um and so ultimately you've just got to just got to put the ball in your own court and ask for it and continuously ask for it until you get it you know and you will get it eventually if they don't want if they don't want you to, to lose you you know um Sometimes executive assistants can be their own, um, they can do themselves down by coping so well. You know, I, I often see really high performing office managers or EAs who are doing such an amazing job. They're doing the job of like two or three people and they keep asking for a pay rise and the company, for whatever reason, doesn't give them one because they're coping and, you know, um, they end up then hiring three people to replace that person with. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, if you'd have just given them Twenty percent pay rise that have been happy and stayed. Right. Uh, so it's just teaching people how to have the confidence to back themselves and, and ask for a raise. And it's about putting a business case forward and what the value is of keeping you and um, and 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 why what it's going to cost them to replace you and all this sort of stuff. Because you know recruiters are expensive. <laughs> We're expensive. Mm-hmm. And if and if your organisation can save money on paying a recruitment fee because you're going to leave, then use that in your, to your advantage. You know when it yeah. comes to negotiating. Yeah, and I think the uh, part of the deal, you know, if you're asking for a raise and you're presenting a strong business case and you're not getting it, then that shows that your organization doesn't value you like you maybe yeah. thought they did. And so then that's a, for a lot time of us, that's on. a time to move on to an organization that will value you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the more and more companies don't 
value their support staff. They're just not going to survive in today's world because everything's so visible that it will be obvious, you know, that they that those companies don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you could snap your fingers and instantly give all assistance more of something, what would it be? Curiosity. Like thirst for knowledge. You know, if I if I could just if I met assistants every day who really wanted to learn about what the company is doing and what their execs are doing, I think it would step change. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Savan, thanks so much for taking time out of your day and uh, talking with us and sharing your tips on recruiting. I uh, love to hear from different perspectives. Um, I've chatted with you know, VA, remote assistant firms. I've chatted with executives. I've chatted with assistants. Um, and um, recruiters are kind of another uh, pillar of the whole EA world. I'm, so Yeah. I think we can sometimes be a necessary evil, right? I think, um, unfortunately, some recruiters, you know, can oper- operate really, you know, but in, in, in underhand ways and in not, not in great ways. And they're not champions of of the people that they're representing. But I do see it becoming more and more that the best recruiters are are really championing the people that they place and, and wanting to work hard on their behalf to give them a voice. And that's that's definitely what we're trying to do. And we're not the only company that are doing it. And it's great to see because, um, you know, as I said, EAs typically aren't the, they're not the ones out there making themselves the center of attention. And they do struggle giving them with a voice sometimes and then knowing how to position things and knowing how to ask for things. And, and that's really what we're trying to do is just be that voice, you know? Um, Mm. so thanks so much for having me and listening to me waffle on. Um, (laughs) I hope some of it was useful. And obviously if any of your listeners have any specific questions about their CV or interviewing or anything, you know, we'd be more than happy to help. Yeah, so where can we find you online and, and where can my listeners check you out? Yep, so our website is um, just jossearch.com. That's triple S. It's not job search, although obviously that is what we do. <laughs> um, and so you can find us on there. We're also on Instagram, uh, Joss Search UK, LinkedIn. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter online and we try and every month we send out really um, topical, interesting content around the the EA world and sort of the, the profession and training. And we recommend podcasts um, and um, tips of, of courses and progression stories. And next month, we're going to be featuring a blog from a float PA who um, has been with a company for nine years as a float and has just become the office manager for a global um, investment company. And uh, just a really great story about why I don't know if you have I think you do have the float PA role in the US so it's it's kind of the the, the in-house temp okay. um, and sometimes it's like the least attractive role but um, actually when for the right person it can be a great a great opportunity so yeah things like that on our newsletter um, and um, obviously my contact details are, are, are found on the website and obviously you can follow me and everything on LinkedIn as well so yeah that's for the best way Awesome. Well, I'll put all those links in the show notes uh, to make it easy for for everyone. And yeah, we'll talk to you soon. And thanks so much again for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks again for listening. Check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash 86. And be sure to join our free global assistant community at leaderassistant.com slash community. Please review on Apple Podcasts. GoBullows.com